Case five is a 70 year old man with a slowly growing periocular mass. Now this one is a, just a real classic example, a perfect example. Once you've seen it, you'll remember it forever. This is, you can see from low power, multiple nodules of blue mucoid material, mucin, um, a sea of mucin basically. And in that sea, we have floating many islands of variable size that are blue and they're composed of blue cells, usually with relatively uniform round nuclei. Um, I feel like most of the cases I've seen of this entity have relatively bland nuclear features, although it can really run a range and sometimes they can be more atypical, but I feel like most of them are relatively bland and monotonous in, in my experience. Okay, so this of course is mucinous carcinoma. Uh, remember that mucinous carcinomas can arise at a wide variety of anatomic sites. Um, the breast is one of the first that comes to mind, and also you can have them in the GI tract and other places. But um, the, when you see a mucinous carcinoma and it's near the eye, um, all of the cases I've seen of mucinous carcinomas near the eye have been primary cutaneous skin primaries, not metastases. I suppose it's theoretically possible that someone could have a mucinous carcinoma from elsewhere in their body that presents as a single metastasis near the eye, but that seems statistically quite unlikely, okay? But I suppose it's always possible. Um, the features, though, are very characteristic here. Um, and this should be a really, a really important thing to think about when you have a mass near the eye um, in an adult. The uh, mucinous carcinomas are not, I don't know, I wouldn't say they're super rare. I, I see them on a regular basis, rarely as, as uh, dramatic as this one. But what I also want to talk to you about here is in addition to the classic mucinous carcinoma, look what's going over on over here to the side. We have a, a dilated cystic space that's got some hemorrhage into it. It's lined by a thin kind of double layer of cuboidal to columnar epithelium. So if I had a cyst near the eye that was lined just like this, I would call that a hydrocystoma, which is a cystic sweat duct proliferation, or, or I'm not sure exactly if it's neoplastic or, or a developmental kind of acquired or acquired cyst, I don't know actually, uh, but, but we see these as small translucent uh, little papules on the cheek or near the eye um, in patients, and they have this bland double layer cuboidal to columnar line, and that's called hydrocystoma. But here, we don't just have a double layer, look what happens. The lining gets thicker and more proliferative and kind of grows outward and pushes into the lumen. Now, one thing that comes into mind when you see this is something called a cystadenoma, and sometimes people call them apocrine cystadenoma or ecrine. As you'll learn as you study Dermpath in adnexal things, people love to talk about whether something's apocrine or ecrine, and I feel like a lot of times it doesn't really matter, and people just like to argue over it, and it, it's not really important for patient care to me. So it uh, depends if you're a lumper or a splitter, I guess. In any case though, here in this case, we have what looks like a, a hydrocystoma slash cystadenoma, but it's growing right next to a mucinous carcinoma. So in, and over here, look, you can see some other areas. This is another kind of ductal space that's filled with these kind of like arches and, and trabeculae that kind of fill up the whole luminal space. And you just have some little cystic ducts left behind and a little bit of mucin in here too. So if you've ever seen breast pathology, this, this, and I'm not a breast pathologist, so I hope anyone who is a breast pathologist watching this will forgive me, but this kind of reminds me of like usual ductal hyperplasia. So it's been described that next to mucinous carcinomas, you can sometimes see a, a component of what's basically an in situ component that's a precursor to mucinous carcinoma. Sometimes, and people have likened that to resembling usual ductal hyperplasia, atypical ductal hyperplasia, or ductal carcinoma in situ of the breast. And you can, just like you can see mucinous carcinoma in the breast, you can see it in the skin. So it's kind of a kind of an analog of what's happening in the breast. And that kind of makes sense because breast glands are kind of similar in, in many ways to um, sweat glands. And there's also similarities in immunostaining between sweat gland tumors and breast tumors, which is kind of interesting and also can be challenging diagnostically sometimes if you ever have to sort those two things out. So in the past, people described that you have these precursor lesions. When you find a precursor lesion like this right next to a mucinous carcinoma, it's extra proof that what you have is almost certainly arising as a primary in the skin, not a metastasis, okay? And um, in more recent years, in the past decade or so, 
um, Artur Zembowitz and others have come up with the idea that oftentimes these precursor lesions that have this kind of cystadenoma-like appearance, often they produce some mucin with them, they tend to stain with neuroendocrine markers. And so the name has been given to these uh, uh, endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma. And it's recognized that those lesions, endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinomas usually occur near the eye and they often produce mucin and sometimes they evolve into invasive mucinous carcinoma. So this case was actually shared with me from a colleague in a teaching, um, a teaching slide exchange. So I don't have um, I don't have information about whether this stain with neuroendocrine markers, but I would bet you that if you did a synaptophysin or an INSM1 here, it would light up these cells very nicely and that this is an endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma that's a precursor lesion to the invasive mucinous carcinoma seen next door. Now, if you do, another thing you can do that I like to do in this setting is to do a P63 or a P40 stain, which will nicely highlight the basal layer of myoepithelial cells here, but is typically negative in these more apical cells that are facing the lumen. And um, that's a very nice evidence when you see that layer of myoepithelium. It's evidence that you have kind of an in situ component arising from the background sweat duct system. And that that, again, is further evidence that you're dealing with a primary cutaneous process, not a metastasis. So if you do have a doubt, you can always check the patient's history. If all you have is mucinous carcinoma and you're worried that maybe it's a MET, you could recommend that they check history or even that they do imaging studies to exclude that possibility. But like I said, if it's near the eye, the vast majority of them, at least in my experience, all the ones I've seen have ended up being primary from the skin and uh, not a metastasis. So a really nice example of mucinous carcinoma with a precursor, probably endocrine mucin producing sweat gland carcinoma. And again, the, the distinction between these, while it's really interesting and it helps support the idea of a skin primary origin, they are both indolent and, and they should be excised with negative margins when possible, but they have very indolent behavior and very good prognosis. So, uh, so the both entities are, are very good um, and, and can be tr treated successfully with, with a complete excision and usually the patients have a good outcome.